because Jesus was not yet glorified. This was actually scandalous for him to stand up and say, you want to drink water? Come to me. And living waters will flow out of you. He was in essence saying, not only he was the Messiah, but he was Yahweh himself in human flesh. I am the fountain of living waters, he was saying. And I can put that inside of you. Now the unbelievers that were at the feast at that time, just their jaws dropped and they were, they were beside themselves. But those who understood, looked at him and saw, those who had ears to hear suddenly realized this was the one for whom all creation was made. They saw in him the very purpose and meaning of life for them and for the world. And that is God's heart for us. Do you know that the joy, God's, God's passionate hunger and desire for us, for you and for me, is that we would live life in the fullness of the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is life. That is life. That is living. You look in the book of Romans, in the typical theology scriptures, where you know you go into this stuff about predestination and election and you know all these debates that men have until everybody in the house is asleep. <laughs> and I find these nuggets of gold, man, that just blow my mind. We serve a God of celebration. It is the joy of the Holy Spirit that allows us to walk the Christian life. It says in Romans. The spirit of, for the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law couldn't do because it was weak in the flesh, Christ was able to do it. And it's the power of life. He says if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's the power to walk the Christian life. We can't even do it without the Holy Spirit. But it turns, it turns our life instead of an obligation, it turns it into a celebration. There is power in that. If we want to live for God, we have to do it out of a spirit of celebration. It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. Obligation and duty will only carry you so far before you run out of gas and fall woefully. But I love what it says, Romans 14, 7. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. Joy in the Holy Spirit. You ain't got joy in the Holy Spirit. You ain't got the kingdom. That's what it's all about. It's about getting up in the morning and starting to open your mouth to praise God. And as you draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. And He will fill you. And out of the overflow of that joy, out of the overflow of that confidence and boldness, it gives us the strength to go out and represent Him and live life in fellowship with God. Oh, gosh. Where's my other scriptures here? Oh, I'll get there. All right, I'll talk about these theology scriptures. I'm going to get there. This is so cool. I love this. But anyway, without the joy, without the joy of the Holy Spirit, we can't do this thing. We'll fall. I've tried religion. I, I have made all my best attempts with noble efforts and, and, and the highest of goals and fell flat on my face, messed everything up. But it's the joy of the Holy Spirit. If we walk in that celebration that will give us the power to live for God. Did you know? This blew my mind. Did you know when the Jews came back from Babylon, they'd been in captivity 70 years, and the guy said, okay, you can go home now, and they kind of straggled back, and then decades later, some of them finally started coming, and Nehemiah was among them. And he went to Jerusalem, he saw the walls were falling down, he says, we really got to do something about this. And so he gets a bunch of people together, and it says in Nehemiah 8.14, in the process of this, this is so Wow, I couldn't believe it. It says, then they found, first they found the book of the law. They were like, whoa, no, what's this? Oh, we're supposed to be doing this. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, go out to the mountain, bring olive branches, branches of olive oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, branches of leafy trees to make booths, because it's written, 
And then the people went out and brought them and they made themselves booze, one on each, each one on the roof of this house, or in their courtyards, or the courts of the house of God, and in the open square of the water gate, and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. Verse 17 blew my brain. 17, so the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths, sat under the booths, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, yep. hundreds of years, hundreds of years, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day under Nehemiah, the children of Israel had not done so. Generations uncounted had come and gone, had been born, lived, and died, and had never celebrated this feast that was part and parcel of the very commandments of God. Is it any wonder that they fell into sin? Is it any wonder that they had to be carried away? Is it any wonder they had no strength to obey because they didn't understand the joy of God? You can't grunt it out. You can't grind it out on your hands and knees. It comes from a love relationship of joy and intimacy and fellowship and celebration. That's the power to live for God. And that's what we have in the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so vital that we dwell and walk in that fullness. What would have happened to the history of Israel if they had realized the power of celebration rather than obligation and walked in the joy of the Lord rather than the grudging duty to try to obey? The Christian life was never meant to be some list of rules and regulations that we try to, you know, just try to somehow white knuckle through so that we don't get clobbered in the head. That is not Christianity. Christianity is God coming alongside of us, putting His Spirit in our heart and giving us joy unspeakable and full of glory. And out of that fullness, we cannot but live for Him. It's the Holy Spirit that makes it possible. Okay, theology scriptures, check this out. Any theologians in the house? No, okay, well, <laughs> good, because this is not the theology that I learned about these scriptures. Galatians 3, 13 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, became a curse for us, because it's written, everyone who cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, so that he was cursed so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. And that's where most theologians stop. Christ became a curse for us so that we could be reconciled to God. Isn't it nice we're reconciled to God? But that's not where it stops in Scripture. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Redemption was not the end goal. It was the means that had to be accomplished in order for us to come into fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit. The Holy, the promise of the Spirit was behind it all. From the very beginning, He said, I'm going to have a people who know me. And it's through His Spirit that we know Him. He reconciled us, not just to say, well, the slate is clean, as good as that is, as much as, as, as delighted as I am that I don't have to go to hell. <laughs> he wants to bring heaven on earth in my life. He wants us to experience that fullness of joy and glory as a foretaste of what's to come. Christ took our curse upon himself.